Welcome to Learn at Work, a webinar series presented by the journal Work, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation published by iOS Press. These Learn at Work webinar series in 2018 are presented in cooperation with the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. I'm Karen Jacobs, the founding editor of Work, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. And now I'd like to turn the webinar over to our speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Josiane Lamat. Uh, I'm a PhD student in criminology at the Université de Montréal. And I'm here today to talk to you about uh, my thesis topics, so patient violence, but also an article that I published in work uh, last year. Uh, I'm uh, I'm so glad that you're tuning in and I'm really happy to be here today and I would like to thank Karen for giving me this opportunity. Uh, perfect. So, perfect. So I'm just going to give you like a brief outline of where I plan on going with this. So um, I'm first going to give you uh, an overview of what patient violence is, so how prevalent it is, how serious of a problem it is, and then I'm going to talk to you about meaning in general. So um, the way we make meaning out of life and more specifically the way we extract meaning from our work and why that's important. I will then uh, go on describing my study. Uh, so the aim of my study, the participants that took part, uh, the findings that I was able to derive from my uh, analysis, the conclusions and the limitations. I will end my presentation with a short discussion on future directions and where I hope on going with this. So right here is uh, the full reference to my article, if ever you're interested. It's an article I wrote in collaboration with my thesis supervisor, Mr. Stefan Guy. Uh, and as I said, it was published last year. So um, when we're talking about patient violence, we're talking about a form of workplace violence. Uh, there are currently no agreed upon definition for workplace violence. So uh, researchers and authors tend to use different definitions. Um, some people will tell you that some definitions are better than others. I think mostly um, you should just be honest about the type of definition you've used and the limitations that could be associated with this type of definition, if there are any. Uh, so when I started writing this paper, I uh, used or I had in my head Shat and Calloway's 2005 definition, which states that physical violence um, are defined as uh, physical assaults and other attempts at inflicting physical harm, while insults, threats, and other forms of verbal and symbolic indirect violence are referred to as psychological violence. An example of that would be, for example, yelling, intimidation, or breaking property. Uh, there are other the definitions that exist, and there are also other forms of workplace violence that exist, for example, sexual harassment, which I will not go into. Uh, but just to let you know that these are alternative definitions that I could have used. So um, I will start by giving you sort of like a global portrait of what, what patient violence actually looks like. Uh, I will focus my presentation on violence and psychiatry because that's um, where I recruited my sample from. According to one uh, systematic review, uh, approximately one in five patients will become physically violent during their stay in an inpatient psychiatric care, uh, either towards the staff or towards another patient. Uh, physical uh, patient violence is more likely to occur in psychiatry than in other specialties. And before I move on, I would simply like to state that uh, although some people could say that I'm a bit playing uh, into the stereotype that people that are mentally ill are more violent than people who are not mentally ill. Uh, this is not what I'm insinuating at all, even though it's quite clear that psychiatry is, uh, working in psychiatry is a risk factor for patient violence. Um, the people that are find themselves in inpatient care are not a representative sample of the people who are mentally ill generally. So uh, we shouldn't draw conclusions with regards to people who are mentally ill based on patient violence or just a study like mine that uses a, a sample of workers. Uh, moving on. So if we look at uh, the prevalence of patient violence, uh, most studies in psychiatry tend to report annual rates higher than the 50% mark for physical and psychological violence. Uh, for example, Nishman and colleagues in 2005 reported uh, rates of severe physical assault of 16%. So that's assault leading to broken bones, dislocated shoulders, things like that. Um, but rates climbed to 76% for quote unquote milder types of physical assaults like hitting, scratching or uh, something else. Uh, Kelly and, and colleagues in 2014 found that 70% of their sample had been assaulted at least once and that 42% of them reported a serious form of physical assault. Usually that's measured with severity of uh, injuries. Uh, 
Um, there are some studies um, uh, that report much lower rates of advanced exposure. For example, uh, Devere and colleagues in 2012 reported that 11% of the residents had been assaulted in the last year. Uh, but generally speaking, most studies tend to report uh, rates above the 50% mark, as I mentioned. And as for psychological violence, well, um, the majority of studies report rates that are really close to um, the 100% mark uh, over a year-long period. Uh, I give you as an example Yang and colleagues in 2018 who found that 85% uh, had been the victim of psychological violence in the last six months alone. So you can imagine what it's like over a, a space of a year. Um, if we, go, uh, we look at incidents, so in terms of repeat exposure, um, patient violence is not just a problem that affects many healthcare workers, it's a problem that affects uh, healthcare workers several times. So Ridenor and colleagues in 2015 did an incident study and found that American psychiatric nurses were the victim of 0.19 physical assaults and 0.60 instances of psychological violence each week. So if you multiple uh, you multiply that by 52 weeks, it gives you an average of approximately 10 physical assaults per nurse per year, which is quite significant. Over the same short period, uh, a different study that was done in Canada found that 20% of psychiatric nurses had been physically assaulted at least once, 43% received threats, and 55% endured psychological violence, um, again, and that was just in the space of one week. Um, if we look now in other countries, we see a similar trend. So Abdur Halden and colleagues in 2002 found that 27% of psychiatric workers in Switzerland were confronted with aggressive patient behavior on a daily basis, while 44% reported such events on a weekly basis. So we see that um, really violence in, in psychiatry is very um, prevalent, and it's also pervasive in the sense that it's something that workers are expecting to be exposed to on a regular basis. And this has um, an impact on how workers perceive their work environment. And I think it's really important to look not just at um, the objective criteria for the severity of a phenomenon such as violence, but also look at the more subjective descriptions of it uh, to really understand how it affects people. Uh, mostly in this uh, scenario because uh, some other studies have found that even in the absence of violence, working in an environment that is rife with violence can have a profound effect on the mental uh, health of uh, healthcare workers. So basically just working with uh, the anticipation of violence or working uh, while knowing and being aware of the risk can have a detrimental uh, effect on your mental health. Qualitative studies, uh, when they ask participants to describe the climate, they'll often refer to it as tense and that this reaffirms the need to be constantly vigilant. There are several uh, studies that have also shown that participants tend to work in fear of their patients and that it is unsafe to let that fear show. So they feel that if they were to uh, appear vulnerable, they would be more likely to be assaulted as a result. Um, now, this is a personal impression, not an objective fact, but we will get back to that um, later. And overall, even though uh, workers may not be the victims of physical assaults or uh, psychological violence, the constant possibility of violence tends to wear workers down over time. And so um, people can become exhausted and suffer from the consequences of violence, even if they're not directly exposed to. So it's important for organizations that are trying to understand the seriousness of this problem, not just to look at objective indicators like rates, official reporting, things like that, but also look at the subjective experience of their workers because this will have an impact on how um, their workers behave and uh, whether or not they're likely to go on sick leave or they have turnover intentions or things like that. If we look now at the consequences of psychological violence, um, of uh, sorry, of uh, viol patient violence at the psychological level, we tend to find um, that there are several consequences that can re be associated with patient violence. Um, generally speaking, a lot of studies have reported that uh, levels of psychological well-being tend to be lower in people that have been assaulted by patients versus those who have not. Uh, one systematic review found that anywhere from 9 to 10 percent of workers in psychiatry met the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, and a greater proportion of workers exhibited subclinical levels of PTSD. Um, so that means that um, although they didn't experience sufficiently severe symptoms to be considered um, to receive the diagnosis, they nonetheless suffer from some of the symptoms, and this can become significant over time.
Uh, another frequently reported uh, consequence of patient violence is burnout. Um, it is especially related to high incidence. So the fact that you are the victim of more than one uh, assault or more than one uh, instance of uh, psychological violence. Obviously, if your workers are not doing well, this is uh, this will undoubtedly have consequences for the organization. So if we look at the consequences that have been reported in the literature so far, we found that uh, workers who are assaulted are more likely to have turnover intentions. Organizations also struggle with worker reassignment and duty changes. Uh, lower organizational commitment has also been reported. And obviously there is an increase in sick leave like with all uh, workplace injury. Uh, it is also likely to have an impact on productivity. For example, one study found that assaulted workers uh, subsequently had trouble keeping their mind on work at the rate of 32%, thinking clearly, concentrating on work, and controlling emotional reactions while working with colleagues. I will remind you that we are talking about healthcare workers, so people who have to make decisions with regards to the health of their patients, and that they are still struggling with these consequences as a result. And you can see how in a context like that, uh, not being able to keep your mind on work or thinking clearly could lead to mistakes which can have serious impact on the lives of patients. Another interesting field uh, to study is how patient balance affects uh, the clinical aspect of the work, so the relational consequences, if I could say. Um, overall, there seems to be um, lowered quality of care in units where they report more patient balance. Uh, it also affects patients in different ways. For example, one study found that there is less effective interprofessional communication, unanticipated changes in patient mix, and extended waiting periods for um, patient placement when there is more patient balance. Uh, another study associated patient balance with longer length of stay, more readmissions, and higher drug use, which can be problematic for the health of patients. And the same study that I referred to before with regards to productivity, um, this is quite important. Uh, one study found that uh, workers express, and so they are aware, that they have a harder time of, of providing emotional support to patients, so that's one in four, providing emotional support to families, being empathetic with patients and families, and controlling emotional reactions with patients. This is a really important aspect of patient balance, and I'll get back to it later on. Uh, there are also another field of study that tends to look at the use of coercive measures uh, or coercive methods, and usually those are um, physical, chemical restraints, so the use of drugs to calm patients down or the use of uh, sort of um, physical restraints to keep people um, constrained from kicking or uh, fighting off other people, and the use of seclusion where people would be put in a room alone for an extended period of time. Uh, these types of methods um, are questionable in the sense that they haven't proven that they could reduce the level of violence. And if you interview patients that have uh, endured those methods, they tend to report that it's incredibly humiliating to be uh, physically restrained and secluded for a period of time. This brings me to uh, what we call the cyclical hypothesis. So the cyclical hypothesis is just that, a hypothesis. Um, the main reason why I say this is because currently the robustness of studies that have suggested a link uh, between those different concepts um, is weak. And so, um, for example, if you have a cross-sectional design, you could um, suggest that patient balance causes emotional exhaustion, for example, but you could also say that emotional exhaustion causes uh, you could also speculate and say that emotional exhaustion um, causes patient balance. Um, and this is what we refer to as the cyclical hypothesis, whereas some variables associated with patient balance can be both causes and consequences. Um, the reason why I'm talking about it, even though it's not uh, firmly established in the literature, is simply because from a clinical perspective, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you walk in the words, if you walk into hospital, if you ask people about their experiences with patient violence, you will see how these variables and probably others um, are very likely both causes and consequences of patient balance. And this kind of reminds organizations to really take a look at not just, you know, which patient are violent and why, but also look at the whole social dynamics around it and how it's really more of an ecological problem more than just an, uh, uh, um, an individual problem. You know, it's not just mental illness, it's probably the way people interact with one another in a mental health setting.
So I will uh, present to you some of the evidence that suggests that this cyclical hypothesis could be real and uh, should be studied further. So for example, I did mention that a tense climate uh, could be a consequence of patient balance, but also there are some studies that report that the tense climate could be associated with further violence. So perceiving that the climate is, is tense at time one could increase your odds of being the victim of violence at time two. Um, an unfavorable staff patient ratio is often reported in the context of patient violence. So um, uh, obviously I talked about how there's high turnover, there's more sick leaves when there's patient balance, but also this could result in uh, the organization having a hard time scheduling workers. And so uh, the staff constantly find themselves uh, in lower numbers than they would need to actually meet the um, uh, meet a, a proper level of care, so to speak, and so that could increase the risk for the remaining staff to be the victim of violence as well. Um, if we look at um, the relational dynamics, so the carer-patient relationship, we find that emotional exhaustion, or what I state as, you know, variations thereof, because some people study distress, some people study burnout, some people study aspects of burnout only, um, but there seems to be a link between the mental health of workers and their ability to be there emotionally for their patients and their ability to create good rapport with their patients. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at Hammond and colleagues' 2009 review of the triggers of uh, patient balance, you'll see that patients often report lack of communication slash listening, perceived lack of caring, and rush demands as triggers for their violence. And so patients expect to have a certain level of um, interaction, so to speak, with their workers and their workers that are exhausted have a harder time meeting that standard that patients have set. And so this could be, um, you know, a trigger for um, some patients um, to become violent. And this is important because we don't always think about how being emotionally unavailable can uh, lead to other people being violent with us. And of course, there's the use of co uh, coercion or other coercive methods. I'm mentioning that because, as I mentioned, nurses that are fearful have a tendency to uh, consider themselves more likely to use these types of methods. And there are some studies that suggest that it is in the context of trying to forcibly restrain a patient or forcibly uh, seclude a patient that violence occurs. So in that process of trying to restrain a patient, a nurse might get kicked in the face, for example. And there are some studies that found that if nurses are confident, they feel comfortable, they will delay that decision to restrain patients. So there is um, an aspect that is um, of using course of methods that could lead to having both causes and consequences uh, with regards to patient balance. So this is kind of like a broad overview of what we mean uh, or what I look at when I look at patient balance. Um, and now I will kind of move on to the second part of my presentation, so my second uh, variable of interest, so to speak, which is uh, the meaning of work. So the study of the meaning of work kind of fits into the study of meaning in general. Um, there are a lot of psychologists and researchers in psychology that look at the protective um, nature of having of finding meaning in one's life and how that can be a powerful tool against adversity. Um, and so it, when I'm talking about meaning, it's not just a philosophical sort of abstract concept. It's also a very real, tangible, practical slash therapeutic um, concept. So there is really a lot of benefits to studying um, the way workers make sense of their work and how patient balance fits in all of this in order to understand how they can become more resilient in the face of patient balance. I do uh, believe that a lot can be done to reduce rates of patient violence, but I'm not convinced that it's possible to completely eliminate the risk. I think there will always be a risk. And for that reason, it's important to look at how people can be, um, how we can promote resilience in those workers. And so if we look at definitions of meaning, um, we see that uh, one author, for example, had this really elaborate definition. Uh, its meaning is the degree to which people have achieved a comprehensive understanding through making sense of their own lives, experiences, and develop a, developing a coherent mental model of themselves, the world around them, and their fit within uh, those interactions. 
and have a purpose through um, discerning, committing to, and pursuing overarching lifelong goals, aims, and aspiration. So really what we're talking about meaning, we're talking about how people make sense of something or how they understand something. And the fact that you understand something uh, can help you overcome adversity or difficult situations. If you're interested, there's a whole field of psychology that is called um, the study of post-traumatic growth. So how people um, can thrive in the presence of adversarial, adversarial circumstances. Uh, and how they are capable of turning these unfavorable circumstances into opportunities for growth. And meaning making is an essential aspect of that. There are even some people that are saying that um, being able to make meaning out of our experiences is the base of resilience. Um, so there's a lot of benefits in trying to understand how people make sense of the traumatic experiences that they go through. Um, meaning, uh, you will have figured out by, that, by my description already, is associated with greater life satisfaction, happiness, empowerment, and gratitude. Um, it's a way that clinicians can increase overall um, client happiness. And it's led some people to saying that meaning is a crucial aspect of a flourishing life. Now, when we talk about meaning of work, it's somewhat similar, but it's in a much more specific aspect uh, of the human life. Uh, adults spend a lot of time at work, so are definitely benefits of understanding how people make sense of their uh, work. Um, it is related to how we make meaning uh, uh, you know, in life in general, but I'm really, for this study, I really looked at uh, specifically how people make sense of their work, what's the meaning of work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when we start looking at this more specific type of meaning making, um, the concept has been poorly defined. Uh, there are several terms that have been used over the last decade um, that have been used interchangeably as, as if they mean the same thing or incorrectly uh, to refer to the meaning of work, and this can be quite complicated. I will refer to you, uh, if you're interested, to Ross and colleagues' 2010 um, literature review on this subject. It is highly informative. It was um, a really interesting paper. And they came up with sort of like a global definition of the meaning of work, which is what I use to uh, try to uh, uh, analyze the interviews that we, um, we collected. So uh, the meaning of work refers to both the significance and worth subject subjectively attributed by work, um, individuals to what they do and the representation of it as well as the coherence between the individual's expectation, values, and behaviors and the job performed, often referred to as meaningfulness. Uh, uh, for this study, I will simply state that meaning can be both positive, neutral, and negative. And so, for example, uh, if you really enjoy driving a car, it can have a positive meaning. It can be associated with freedom, autonomy, uh, movement. Uh, but if you get into a car accident, it can acquire a negative meaning. Uh, you can start wondering, um, thinking repetitively about the uh, accident. And so, uh, you know, the car can have a different meaning in the sense that it could be viewed as something that is also dangerous after an accident. Um, I will start by mentioning that there are very few studies on the meaning of work and workplace violence, probably because it tends to be, um, you know, we tend to study the meaning of work and just work in general, and workplace violence really deals with a specific aspect of work, and we're more worried about mental health than meaning. Um, there's only one study that I was able to find before I wrote my article on the meaning of work and workplace violence, and it was looking at the bullying experiences of nurses, not uh, patient violence. So uh, I do believe that there should be more studies on the topic, and that's partly in thinking about that that I wrote this paper. Um, there are some major benefits to studying uh, the meaning of work, mostly that workers who find meaning in their work are more likely to report higher levels of work engagement, organizational identification, job satisfaction, and individual performance. And this tends to benefit the organization as a whole. So uh, again, it's not just an abstract meaning that has no practicalities. It's really um, understanding how people make sense of their work, how they derive meaning from their work can really help us understand how they relate to their work and um, how we can uh, uh, really understand how workers make sense of it all. Um, if we look at my study, the aim that I had at the beginning was uh, 
uh, to describe the influence that workplace violence has on the meaning of work. So I suspected that um, if you uh, are the victim of a patient assault and you are perhaps even the victim of several instances of patient violence, uh, perhaps this in time would have an impact on the meaning of work and this uh, we would be able to notice these changes. So the way that I went about um, verifying that it is that we conducted, um, me and other members of my lab, we conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with 15 healthcare workers in a psychiatric hospital in Canada, 11 women and four men. Obviously it was a convenience sample. Um, the way that we structured the interviews basically is that all participants were asked to take part in two interviews, one that specifically looked at the meaning of work before the assault and meaning of work after an assault, and each interview lasted about an hour each. Um, of course, you know, like both interviews in actuality took place after the assault. So I was asking the participants to locate themselves in time, like before uh, you were assaulted, what did you, how did you make sense of your work, what was important to you, and after, like, what are some of the changes that you noticed? Um, I'll get back to that section in my limitation section. Uh, just for your information, uh, I used a uh, phenomenological uh, approach and um, 15 healthcare workers is actually a pretty large sample for that type of approach. Uh, the selection criteria very quickly, uh, well obviously the workers had to have been assaulted by a patient in the, in the last 10 years while working at the hospital. Um, I We re restricted our selection to people who had been on sick leave following the event just to make sure that the event was severe enough for people to be aware of a before and after if there is one. And of course, to be willing and able physically and psychologically to complete an interview on the subject. So when I'm talking about my approach, uh, phenomenology, uh, we looked at uh, an author called Giorgi, who in 1999 wrote a guide on the subject. Uh, there are five steps to this approach. So the first step is to read the interviews um, over and over again in um, an effort to kind of get a general sense of what participants are saying uh, and what, uh, what you understand of their experience. Um, then you separate the interviews into different units of meaning and you try to identify common themes uh, in those units of meaning. Um, then the goal is to kind of summarize the themes and subthemes for each participant separately before putting them together as a general portrait uh, as you're writing the article. Always trying to uh, refer back to the lived realities of participants. Um, you'll see how I managed to do that with uh, my findings sections. Um, perfect. So just to look, give you an idea of what patient balance is and how it affects workers, I gave you sort of four, uh, sorry, three um, stories from one of my participants. I'm using pseudonyms here. These are, aren't actually their real names. Uh, so for example, Katie, 33, uh, was working as an orderly when she ran to her colleague's help. Uh, he was being strangled by a patient. She she and another colleague tried to contain the patient, but he managed to push her away and kick her repeatedly with his feet and knees. Uh, Katie is disappointed that the rest of the team took refuge behind the nursing station instead of coming to her help. Lisa, 43, an orderly, was helping a patient getting out of the shower when she became agitated. Uh, the patient aimed for her eyes, scratching her cornea, punching her several times in the face and upper body. Uh, she had to wait 2.5 years before her shoulder was healed uh, sufficiently for her to go back to work. And lastly, Sylvia's story, uh, 32. Uh, she was working as an assistant nurse taking vital signs when she was attacked. A patient did not want to wait for her assistant. She grabbed the nursing assistant by the hair and threw her on the ground. Sylvia says she froze at that moment and she really did believe that she was going to die. Luckily, one of her colleagues intervened and was able to get the patient from off of her. Um, so as I was looking at the themes and sub-themes and when I put them back together, I noticed that there were uh, kind of two broad themes and then six sub-themes. So meaning of work and others. So for example, relationships with colleagues, relationship with patients and the relationship with the organization. And the meaning of work and the self or the individual. So uh, how meaning of work is uh, related to self-accomplishment through work, uh, autonomy and social contribution. I'm going to go through the themes and sub-themes one by one. Um, so if we look at the first uh, sub-theme, uh, basically relationships with colleagues, um, 
we see that, first of all, what I know it is that it's a very important, highly appreciated aspect of work with participants. It gave participants a lot of positive meaning. Um, we all want to belong, and I think a relationship with colleagues kind of addresses that human need. Uh, 12 of the 15 participants explain how their relationship with colleagues helped them find positive meaning into their work. Uh, you have here um, a quote from Katie who said that before the act of violence, I liked the contact with people. I liked my colleagues. I also liked the work climate that was always respectful. If we look, though, uh, at what can happen after a, uh, an act of violence, things can change for some people. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the quote from Rosalind here, she says, um, I took them, um, I trust them a little bit more now, but there's still something that's, uh, there's still something still a bond that is broken. You always ask yourself, hey, are you really going to be there if it blows up? It's always a risk that you're taking. You don't know if they're going to intervene if there's something. And then the interview asks, do you still see your colleagues outside of work? Less and less, a lot less. I still see them, but a lot less. I'm less available, I'm less interested. So there's three participants that admitted that their perceptions of their relationship with colleagues change after being assaulted by their patients. Usually it was in the context of um, their coworkers not coming to their help as they were being assaulted or uh, trying to seek support from colleagues and having them um, not finding them not being able to uh, meet their expectations. Um, there were different ways that people expressed um, this. Um, so basically, um, for example, it could move from temporary discontent to a need to withdraw to even feeling betrayed, like in the story of Rosalind here. For some people, it was just like temporary bad feelings. For other people, it was something a little bit more permanent that was clearly, you know, a before and after and things still aren't back to normal as they were talking about it during the interviews. Um, if we look at relationship with patients, uh, obviously, as you would expect from uh, professionals who have chosen a caring profession, this was really at the core of what made sense, um, how they made sense of their work. So Lisa, for example, says that the interaction that I had with the clients is what I loved about my job. That's something I liked a lot uh, with others. But you know, in my job, it's not necessarily the contact with the secretary or the nurse. It's really my contact with the patient in and of itself to take care of him, to make sure he's got everything he needed that day to go about his things, uh, doing his activities. It's really that. Uh, the patient care relationship plays a huge role in how people derive positive meaning from their work. 14 out of the 15 participants detailed at length how their relationships with patients gave them positive meaning. Um, however, uh, after an assault, things tend to change, uh, especially after a serious assault. So um, half of participants noticed changes in the way they perceive the relationship with patients after. Uh, again, there was kind of a gradient. Uh, some people talked about a temporary vigilance, fear, or and some people talk about more worrisome um, trends such as uh, worsening apathy. Um, the, that gradient is kind of illustrated here with the citation. So the first one, for example, uh, the first weeks it changed for sure, but with time things came back to how they were. I like my work and it's that sense that I want to continue. Uh, Henry here kind of has like a, a, a difference that he thinks will probably be permanent, but it still doesn't affect him from being able to care about his patients. Um, I'm keeping a distance. Let's say a patient asks me for something in his room, honestly, I'll think about it twice. And if when I go to the room to open the drawer, I'm careful when I'm opening it. I'm always looking. Before, I would give him my back. Now, I try at least when I do, I have a view of what he's doing, of what he's in the midst of doing. So there's a certain vigilance right there um, with regards to patients and uh, the perceived need to be, uh, to be active in uh, keeping oneself safe. And then there's a the story of Cecilia. Um, it's not interest. It's, I have less sympathy towards client, really. Uh, I'm a little bit disillusioned. I don't know how to say it. So something like that is a lot more serious in terms of um, meaning and um, probably could be due to something more serious like burnout. But it's important to look at how people perceive the relationship with people and how it gives positive or negative meaning to their work. Um, I'm presenting to you here the story of Katie because uh, she had a particularly compelling story, in my opinion. 
Um, Katie started as a janitor at the hospital, and uh, as she was working as a janitor, she noticed how uh, the orderlies were having such a positive impact on the lives of patients, and she kind of fell in love with that profession and decided to go back to school to become an orderly and work with patients. Uh, at first, she really enjoyed her work, but then, as I mentioned, she was one of the examples that I gave earlier. After a serious assault by a patient, she just could not work as an orderly anymore and went back to working as a janitor. And when she was asked why, she said, I don't have the same responsibilities. If someone is sleeping or they don't want me to come into their room, well, I'll just go to the next one and that's it. I don't need to argue. We do the common areas, we do the bathrooms, and we don't do anything that entails big risks. And so um, her um, need to feel safe is really what drove her career change from you know, giving up on her dream as a medical orderly to become a janitor once more. Um, now, uh, with regards to relationship with the organization, um, it was interesting to notice that in the before interviews, no participants kind of mentioned how the organization cont contributed positively to uh, the, the meaning of work in their opinion. Uh, but then suddenly when things went bad or when they weren't satisfied with uh, the organization's response, uh, suddenly uh, it clearly had an impact on how they view uh, themselves within the organization. So none of the participants, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, uh, if you look at uh, Peter's story, so what changes my attitude toward my employer? The obvious lack of support, maybe the complete lack of interest regarding hospital policies. I don't know because we know it's hogwash, you know, we're going to talk about it for a week. And after that, everything will remain exactly the same as before. So Peter is somebody who, after being assaulted, tried to implement changes to, to keep himself and other people around safer. And he personally feels that the organization wasn't very receptive. And that's made him believe that perhaps the organization was not uh, as invested in his safety as he had originally believed. And that kind of changed his perspective of as to where he fit in the organization and how he made sense of himself in the workplace. Um, if we look at Sylvia's uh, story, uh, before I used to think it was important to get involved in your work in decision making, and now I don't find it important anymore. I don't, I have this I don't care attitude. Like, do whatever you want, I don't care. If they ask me for my opinion on something, I'll tell them that I don't care and that they can do whatever. It's really like that. So uh, we can start to see already, um, we had mentioned about meaning of work and how it promotes uh, organizational engagement. Uh, we can also see how when things take on a negative meaning, how people tend to uh, disengage from their work and fall back to doing the bare minimum and how this can have an impact on the productivity of organizations. Um, so it's important to look at the meaning that people uh, make out of their experiences in that sense, uh, especially for organizations. If we look now uh, in relations to the self, uh, Self-accomplishment, which is kind of a catch-all category that I created to talk about how people felt the need to um, either learn or challenge themselves or set themselves challenges, um, ambitions, and all of that in the context of their work and how that gave their work meaning. Uh, so before an assault, um, for example, Dorothy says, when I leave at night, I like having the satisfaction of having done my job. That's what allowed me to come back home and move on to something else. Uh, Catherine was saying, my job is invigorating. You could see that the patients were motivated. They had life goals. We would do our interventions. They would leave. They would go on and live. We would do follow-ups. Working was stimulating. But then after an assault, five participants kind of notice changes in the way they identify with their job. So if we come back to Cecilia, for example, uh, my job used to be very dynamic. It was changing. Uh, I think we had innovative approaches, working in teams, the fact that I used to learn a lot. I'm a lot less invested at work in general. I come to do my, uh, my work, that's all. I complete the task, but before I used to take it to heart. I was super involved, passionate. No, not at all. I come to work, I provide care, and even sometimes I tell myself, Cecilia, you have to, you know? I don't give bad care, but I tell myself I have to get into it. I do what I have to do, but not more. So again, this is somebody who's really talking about, um, well, how she used to find work really interesting and dynamic, and suddenly, after an assault, went back to just wanting to do the bare minimum. Uh, you realize your potential in your professional life or in your personal life. Often you strike a balance between the two. It's not easy. Me, I decide that I only want to find fulfillment when it comes to family right now. Um, so these were some of the aspects where I noticed changes in the discourse of participants. Uh, 
Uh, but I've also noticed aspect of the work that just didn't change for anyone, aspect of how they make meaning of their work that just did not change at all. Um, so one of uh, there are two sub themes that this was uh, pertinent to uh, contributing to society and personal autonomy. So um, the idea of contributing to society is more than just the patient care relationship. It's really about how you think you're contributing to society's well-being through your work. Um, oftentimes, participants would talk about their deeply held values that motivated them to come carers in the first place, such as altruism, wanting to make a difference, social justice, etc. And they really feel like their job is like the vehicle for them to contribute to society. I feel really useful. I like it. I see my clients in the community, so we follow patients into the community. No matter, um, no. As a matter of fact, I'm very proud, happy to have made that choice. We go into their home. We go see them. We go visit them at their place. Um, I'm part of a team uh, that sees progress, helps them stay in the community, and helps them become independent citizens. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, Katie, even though she um, she stopped being an orderly, she still sees the benefit of that uh, profession, uh, although it wasn't quite as effective a source of resilience for her. Um, I had the impression I was making a difference in the lives of people I was working with, of my patients. And Stephen said, uh, I think there's beautiful care to give. There's beautiful things happening in a sense. It's quite exciting to see people arriving completely disorganized and then quickly in a few days, the person falls back on his two feet and we offer them services. So this appears to be um, one way that people make meaning out of their work that seems to be protective or seems to um, continue to provide positive meaning to their work. The second one is autonomy. So this uh, idea that uh, patients mentioned how being fairly compensated for their work and being able to afford their lifestyle was important to them. Uh, as Henry says, for example, um, without work, you can't do anything. Work is freedom, it's autonomy. Yes, I have a gratifying job. Yes, we have a salary in return, but it's because of work that we get to live. It's because of work that we get uh, to pay for things. I think the dignity of man is to be able to pay for everything, to be able to take care of his family. Um, I think it's important to talk about that because generally in the literature, you kind of see how when people start to value their salary too much, um, it's associated usually with a loss of positive meaning or the absence of positive meaning. So my job is just a paycheck. Um, but there seems to be other aspects tied to it. The idea of being fairly compensated for your efforts, of being able to afford the lifestyle that you want. Uh, this seems to be important aspects. So being autonomous and uh, uh, achieving autonomy through your own standards, through your job, appears to be a source of resilience as well, or at least a source of positive meaning. Um, I will, however, express that there's uh, one person in the study for whom that seems a little bit more nuanced. Uh, for example, um, he didn't say specifically that his job was meaningless to him, but he did say, um, I changed my way of doing things when it comes to my role as a nurse. I tell myself, no, I'm going to fall back on my role as a provider. It's a form of resignation if you want. So I think it's important when we look at how people make sense of their job and how they uh, talk about contribution and how to talk about their salary or autonomy um, to try to see really if it's, uh, they take pride in their autonomy or if they've just decided that a job is just a job, in which case they would suggest that there's no positive meaning um, beyond uh, the money that they get from their work. So in conclusion, uh, what did I um, learn from this study? Well, uh, I found that meaning of work generally remained stable for most participants, even though it did change for some. Uh, I didn't notice changes that was ever more than just half of the participants. Uh, there were different types of changes. For example, some people worked in fear of their patients. Some people reported more. Uh, the in degrees of it as well. So some people talk, for example, about uh, temporary bad feelings with colleagues to a permanent distress. So we can see how um, it's important to study not just changes in me uh, meaning, but also the types of changes that occur. And some aspect of meaning of work remains stable for all participants, for example, autonomy and contribution. And I believe that these could be sources of resilience and explain why people return to work even after being assaulted for the most part. Um, so the study confirms the importance of others in the sense making process. Uh, so the fact that our relationship with colleagues, with patients, the fact that we feel like we belong somewhere uh, helps us make po uh, extract positive sense out of that experience. Um, it also confirmed the fact that employees can feel let down by an organization in the aftermath of an assault and that this can result in lowered organizational commitment or a variation thereof. 
Uh, my study also confirmed that fear can act as a disruptor of the patient care relationship. Um, also, uh, my study confirms that uh, in the aftermath of an assault, uh, this can have an impact on work uh, performance and um, in whether or not people choose to exceed expectations or not. Um, and that's usually done through uh, the vehicle of work values. So what are the contributions that I was able to make uh, with this study? Well, um, this study suggests that finding positive meaning and contributions made to society society through one's work is a source of resilience. And I think this is important because um, as we're trying to make workers more resilient, then perhaps we could focus on what gives workers um, how worker make positive meaning out of their work and how we could use that uh, as an organization to perhaps help them become more resilient in the face of violence. Um, although overly focusing on compensation has been described as a loss of positive meaning, as I mentioned, uh, this reality appears nuanced since most participants expre expressed pride in their autonomy. So what are some of the limitations that are uh, that I have to report with my study? Well, um, first of all, I only interviewed participants that are still at work. So perhaps that if I had studied participants who left their job or switched careers, I would have had a completely different portrait. Uh, I think this is an entirely separate research project, but still it could have been interesting to have their point of view. Also, one of the main challenges of the study was simply that the concept of meaning of work was difficult to, to grasp at times. Uh, we were trying to do interviews on what gives uh, people, or how people make mean, uh, sense of their work, and it wasn't always um, obvious that they understood what we were talking about. However, I feel that the final product was very informative. So even if workers didn't um, fully perfectly understand this uh, concept, they still provided us with a lot of information that was highly pertinent to what we were studying. And of course, I can't ignore the risk of retrospective bias. So both interviews occur after an assault. I didn't interview participants, and then they got assaulted, and then I interviewed them again. So it's possible that people um, sort of you know, associated changes in the way they uh, relate to their work to an assault when in fact it could be due to something completely different, but they just don't want to admit it or uh, whatever. For some reason, I felt the assaults were serious enough for people to be clearly able to identify the before and after, but still it's a risk that I, I have to um, insist on. So where do I think we should go from here? Um, I think it would be important to identify exactly which changes in meaning are most likely to result in mental illnesses, turnover, or lowered productivity. So what is it, what is it that we need to watch out for? How can we help workers? How can we prevent those terrible consequences? How can we prevent negative meaning from like tainting uh, the perception of workers? Um, this is something that uh, I think could be done in another research project. Uh, in contrast, which aspect of the meaning of work could be used to promote resilience or quote unquote speak to struggling workers? So how can, uh, as an organization, we uh, develop this narrative that will really speak to workers and will really help them kind of make sense of violence, of patient violence, given that um, it's probably not likely that we'll be able to eliminate this risk completely. Uh, there's certainly a lot of um, interventions that can be put in place to greatly reduce it. I certainly believe that, but I do believe that with the nature of the population that they treat, that there will always be some risk uh, associated with uh, patient violence. Um, and finally, what about people who left their employment? Uh, was the meaning of work different for those people? What about the people who switched careers completely? Um, how do they make sense of their work and how does that impact uh, and is that or not due to patient balance? Um, this is something that I believe future studies could uh, explore. Uh, yep. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed my presentation and I'm now uh, open to uh, um, answering your questions. Thank you so much for this um, really exciting webinar. Um, I loved um, how you included the voice, the narratives of the participants. Um, we have a, people in attendance. Please type out your questions and I'll post them. Um, and we've got, let's see, a first question. Um, there are many um, places of work that produce violence. Um, mm -hmm. When is it? Um, how can you identify it early? Um, what do you think 
you might do and how might you improve health in the beginning? Uh, so how might I study changes in meaning in different professions? Is that the question? No, I think um, she. I think that um, what uh, Christina is sharing is that there's many places besides the health care yeah. arena where there's violence. Um, but in general, how can you identify that this is a workplace where um, there might be um, violence? And is there anything that can be done to improve um, the health? Uh, the meaning um, before we see, you know, this sort of not outbreak, but um, uh, pattern of violence in the workplace. Uh, yes, um, obviously, the healthcare and social services professions are not the only ones to struggle with violence. Um, like just customer service, for example, um, they are very likely to receive uh, um, psychological insults and threats, even. Um, so. I think it's important to two things. I think um, research has very much focused on trying to have objective indicators of the severity of violence in other um, areas. So how many instances of violence do people, are the people um, reporting? How, uh, is that accurate numbers? And that I think that's definitely one way of trying to identify whether or not violence is a, is a problem in uh, different professions. But I think it's important also, especially with regards to how people uh, make sense of their work to look at the subjective experiences of workers. So uh, do workers feel like violence is an issue in their work? Do they feel safe at work? Do they feel like um, they are properly trained by their organizations to deal with more difficult clients, whether it's in a private sector and customer service or um, in the complaints department or uh, even just construction or things like that? Do they feel like they have uh, they've been given the tools by their organizations and that they need to face these problems? So. I would encourage people to not just focus on the objective indicators of violence to understand whether or not it's a problem, but also the subjective aspects of it. So whether or not workers feel like it's a problem, whether they feel they have what it takes to deal with it, whether they feel safe, whether they feel their organization has their back in that regard. And uh, with regards to meaning, well, I think this really goes with, um, again, trying to understand the subjective experiences of workers um, and try to understand uh, how they feel safe and how they find enjoyment in their work despite the presence of violence or other types of adversities. Uh, I don't think there's um, a way to go around that. Um, your workers react to, yes, objective um, stressors, but, um, the, but it's also important to understand the subjective aspect of it and because it's in the subjective aspect of it that people will develop more serious symptoms such as burnout. Uh, for example, cynicism and like when you listen to somebody who talks about their job and they're very cynical, well, that's a risk factor for burnout. Doesn't mean they're burnt out, but it certainly means that they've, you know, that door's been open and they may be walking in that direction. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, this very, very nice response. And, um, an, an important question. Um, I want to ask a question. Um, yes. What was it like to conduct this study? Um, it was a different methodology than, than some people are familiar with. Um, what meaning did you get from uh, conducting such a study? Um, well, this study really, when I was reading it, really reminding me um, again of how it's important to understand um, not it's like there's a lot of um finding in psychology is kind of interesting where like you would think that because people go through something traumatic that does develop trauma symptoms but actually there's so many factors that come into play into whether or not people will develop trauma symptoms following a traumatic event so around 90 percent of us like uh, by uh, in our lives, we will experience something called a potentially traumatic event. Uh, so somebody we know is going to die suddenly, or we're going to be in a car accident, or we're going to be the victim of violence, or just natural catastrophe, anything. And yet only a minority of us will actually develop um, very serious illnesses. So there's something in the way that we interpret our experiences that will determine whether or not we will be able to bounce back from those experiences or not. Um, and so for me, really, that study was like the first time that I um, really delve into the whole qualitative kind of aspect of patient balance. And it kind of just reminded me how important it is to not just um, 
focus on really what is objective, but focus on like the experiences of people and how they make sense of their experience. I was blown away by the severity of some of the instances of violence that people were describing. And I just couldn't believe that people were well enough to go back to work after this and how they managed to, you know, not develop PTSD or just, I was blown away by their resilience really. And this is like what reminded me that, oh my God, there's really something to be seen from how people make sense of those experiences and how they're able to overcome it. And there's really something powerful to be studying in there. And that's what really got me interested in how people make sense. Uh, and that's how I make sense of my thesis. Uh, I want to understand um, how people deal with uh, uh, really traumatic events and still, still be empathetic, kind human beings afterwards it's fascinating to me yeah it's you know i'm an occupational therapist besides being an ergonomist and meaning is extremely important um to me uh and particularly with working with clients and i think you mentioned what um i think makes the difference is resilience um and mm -hmm. we're going to have a special issue of work on resilience because that's i think that seems to be um, the characteristic that we see now um, with helping people make meaning um, from mm -hmm. you know, violence in the workplace or dealing just with what's happening uh, in the world. What, what do you think about that? Oh, I think it would be a great idea. Um, I think uh, we tend to study the negative consequences of uh, incidents, injuries, traumatic events, but we don't pay enough attention to um, how people overcome these events and how um, you can even become a stronger individual uh, psychologically as a result of having undergone and having worked your way through that trauma. So I definitely think that it's important. Um, it also kind of ties in with the concept of hope. Um, you would hope that people who suffer really serious injuries at work are not just exposed to very sort of negative consequences of it or negative narratives surrounding injuries, but that perhaps um, if we had a discussion that was a bit more uh, even just closer to reality that some people do, uh, you know, overcome those injuries and do um, live very fulfilling lives, even though they've been injured afterwards. I think it would be important for people to have sort of like a balance, uh, not denying the negative aspects of injuries or trauma or, uh, you know, other stressors at work, but also admitting that there are ways for us as human beings to grow from that. Very, very nice. And, and, Oh, a wonderful way for us to conclude um, your absolutely fascinating study. Um, I look forward to you submitting more manuscripts to work and hope we can have you do another Learn at Work webinar. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we have a Learn at Work webinar each month in 2018. And um, I hope that you'll join us. Please subscribe to our Learn at Work YouTube channel where you can listen to this webinar again and to all of our webinars from the past and in the future. Thanks again, and thank you to our speaker. Have a wonderful day.